Um, since uh, since I cannot cover uh, uh, the research of everybody here, I'll give you a brief overview of um, uh, my research group, uh, Net Sales. So I work at the intersection of uh, networking systems and machine learning. And um, today I give a high level overview of a couple of projects that we are looking at. So the first one is related to internet resilience. So this is a networking project. Um, so what are the effects of losing internet connectivity? So we know that internet is an indispensable part of our daily social and economic lives and loss of connectivity can affect us significantly, especially now during the pandemic when we are so dependent on it. Now, what if we consider a larger scale? Um, we know that some authoritarian regimes across the world uh, cut off internet connectivity to their citizens uh, during civil unrest, etc. And studies have shown that this has a huge economic impact. Now, what if we think at an even bigger scale? What if we have an outage across the globe lasting weeks or months? Now, you might think that's never going to happen because it never happened in the history of the internet in the past two or three decades. But unfortunately, this could happen. And not just that, it could happen in our lifetime. So the next once in a hundred year disaster after this pandemic could be a solar superstorm that is capable of taking down large parts of the uh, world's internet as well as power grids. And as computer scientists, we are overlooking this threat uh, today. And we don't consider this when, when we build our infrastructure. So I'll give a two slide quick overview of the threat. So coronal mass ejection is uh, generated during a solar superstorm. It's a directional uh, ejection of highly magnetized solar particles from the sun. And when the Earth is in the direct path of a CME, uh, this, these magnetized particles will uh, interact with the Earth's magnetic field and produce uh, uh, currents on the Earth's surface. So don't worry, humans are protected from these uh, because of the atmosphere. But, the, but it can significantly damage our internet infrastructure and also power infrastructure. Um, and the largest solar events in, on record happened in um, 1859 and 1921. And this was long before uh, the, the advent of modern technology. So, uh, and they triggered extensive power outages and caused significant damage to the communication networks of the time, which was the telegraph network. So, uh, but we have never experienced one in recent history. Now, when will it happen next? So the estimates for probability of occurrence of these extreme space weather um, that directly impacts earth uh, uh, range from like 1.6 to 12 percentage. Um, but what is more important is that the sun was actually in a period of low activity in the past three decades when the internet uh, infrastructure was laid out. And today it's emerging, it's slowly emerging from that. So solar activity actually goes through uh, cycles uh, of period length approximately 11 years. So he, here we have the number of sunspots uh, plotted across years. And so there's 11 year cycle and there's also a larger 88 years, 80 to 100 year cycle. And the peak changes across that. So, uh, so and we've been having this uh, since uh, uh, the sun was formed. And what we can see is that the past three decades when the internet infrastructure was laid out, we had a period of low activity and soon we will be emerging out of that. So, uh, so nobody has really looked at the impact of such events on the internet infrastructure. And it is very important that we do so. So, uh, so we first looked at the uh, internet infrastructure itself. Now, just like auroras, uh, higher latitudes are more susceptible to these induced currents. So we did a large scale analysis on how the infrastructure is distributed today in relation to the internet user population. So here on the X axis, we have a latitude threshold and on the Y axis, we have the percentage of population or the internet infrastructure component that is above that threshold. And studies show that uh, latitudes above 40 North or below 40 South is more vulnerable. 
So uh, if we look at that uh, 40 degree uh, uh, line here, we can see that only 16% of the population is uh, above that latitude. But almost 30 to 45% of various internet infrastructure components, uh, such as routers, internet exchange points, DNS root servers, um, submarine cable endpoints are located in this region. So a lot of the infrastructure is in a vulnerable region. And we also did a more complex graph analysis on the internet topology while incorporating risks or, or posed by this uh, uh, CME and found a lot of interesting insights. Um, for example, submarine cables are longer and more vulnerable than land cables, and they're also more difficult to repair. And US actually has a risk of losing connectivity to Europe during this solar storm because most of the connection is between New York and uh, London, and uh, this area is highly vulnerable. But interestingly, Brazil to Europe connection uh, has less chance of being affected. And in Asia, uh, Singapore is kind of like a hub and a, uh, uh, it's less affected. And hyperscale data centers of Google, Microsoft, etc., are unfortunately concentrated in more vulnerable regions. But DNS root servers are more distributed. So uh, this is an interesting, exciting new area. And there are several next steps. How can we design more resilient internet topology and also other infrastructure components? How should we rethink application architectures to handle this worst case scenario? Because our current best practices uh, test software systems under uh, you know, failure models that consider a limited number of failures. And then a CME that originates in the sun can take one to three days to uh, reach Earth. How can we use this lead time effectively? And how can we use other resources such as drones or balloons to bootstrap connectivity when there is an uh, outage? So a, a lot of interesting, new, exciting topic uh, directions in this uh, under this uh, project. And then a quick overview of the second topic, which is uh, verification and interpretability of R controllers. So this is in ML for systems. So today, learning-based controllers are used in a variety of systems, and RL is the method of choice. But then uh, although they offer very good performance, real world adoption is um, very limited due to the black box nature, as well as the lack of robustness guarantees. So we are looking at um, verification and interpretation of these controllers to make them more practical in today's systems. So um, uh, I have more work in uh, systems for ML related to distributed DNN training. And also, uh, 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 most of the faculty will be available during the um, uh, free slot today. So uh, please feel to feel free to uh, drop in. Um, that's all. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Sagita, for the uh, introductory talk. And uh, I think uh, now we are ready for the next talk by uh, Stefan. So uh, you can go ahead and share your screen. Of course, just a uh, quick reminder, if you have any questions to any of the uh, speakers, feel free to, uh, to share that question in the chat box. All right. Well, thanks very much for having me and welcome everyone. Uh, so my name is Stefan Mand. I'm an assistant professor uh, in the Department of Computer Science, and I'm going to present the uh, machine learning group. So um, it's probably almost redundant to tell you, but machine learning is literally everywhere in our world. Uh, you know, machine learning is uh, one of the earliest applications for spam filtering in your email program. Uh, you know, uh, social media pr largely profits from machine learning technologies. Uh, you know, Google Translate, machine translation is big nowadays and works almost perfectly. Um, you know, machine learning is also very present in sort of game AI and game playing. So, uh, for example, it's been beaten like uh, the world champion in Go recently. Uh, uh, machine learning is very important for personalization and recommendation systems, as we all know from Netflix, for example, um, is... Um, you know, uh, there have been enormous breakthroughs in terms of both voice generation, but also voice recognition. Um, and finally, it's, it's kind of really largely responsible for the technologies that are being used in self-driving cars. So we've all heard about that. Um, so why should you study machine learning at UC Irvine then? Um, 
Well, um, we have many outstanding faculty in machine learning and AI. Uh, so large, many of our faculty colleagues are on editorial boards and committees of all major, sorry, um, AI and ML journals and conferences. Um, we have projects funded by NSF, NIH, DOE, DARPA, and various industry labs that we have strong collaborations with. Um, we have a strong reputation in AI and ML because as you, uh, many of you know, there's the celebrated UC Irvine machine learning repository that's been sort of a source for, uh, for data for a long time. And we've had a long history of machine learning research in, in Irvine specifically. You'll see that you're there, you know, your, your colleagues are gonna be very strong. So there are many great um, uh, PhD fellows that you'll meet here. Um, some of our students have won best paper awards at ICML, ASTATS, uh, and, and various other conferences. And, they're funded by fellowships such as from NSF, IBM Research, Microsoft Research, and so on. And um, you know, some of them, our students decide to go to academia or kind of to industry, uh, typically to the big tech companies. We also have major re research um, labs that we collaborate with. Uh, for example, Microsoft Research, Google, Intel, the Jet Propulsion Repository, uh, uh, sorry, Jet Propulsion Laboratory, IBM, Disney, and so on. And um, actually many of our students are also doing internships in these different labs. Okay, so let me try to provide an overview of um, the different areas in machine learning that we cover and also kind of essentially assign phases to these different areas. So first of all, within computer science, um, we cover various areas of machine learning, including statistical learning, deep learning, text analysis, computer vision and reinforcement learning. And, and those are kind of roughly speaking our faculty, even though boundaries are sometimes fluid. So we have sort of more faculty in statistics who are also doing machine learning and also on the system side as Sangeeta just pointed out. Um, but this is kind of roughly the core of, uh, I would say the AI ML group. Um, so we have kind of currently 15 faculty and we're growing rapidly uh, hiring new faculty every year. And it's, it's always a little different to kind of cluster the different research aspects, but here I made an attempt. Uh, so uh, folks on the left-hand side are focusing more on theory and optimization. For example, our recent hire, Johannes Paganias and um, Eric Molsnes. Um, some of them are working more on the interface of machine learning and, uh, and reasoning or classical AI like Alex Aller, Eiler and Rina Dechter. Um, then we have expertise in NLP, computer vision, um, Several faculty focus on computational biology, for example, Jing, um, and also reinforcement learning and, and systems. Okay. But besides, besides sort of the core faculty in machine learning, we also interact with various neighboring disciplines, um, for example, statistics and mathematics, um, in particular because our department has, like historically speaking, always had a strong focus on Bayesian methods, right? Um, and, uh, and this kind of clearly links to kind of the statistics and mathematics department. We have a very strong statistics group, which is just kind of on the lower floor of the same building. And we kind of have very close ties. And, and many of our faculties have also joined affiliations between computer science and statistics. Uh, we also work with the cognitive sciences and economics, for example, and also with engineering. In terms of other schools, uh, we certainly have ties to the business school uh, where, you know, as you can imagine, predictive modeling and operations research are connecting points. Uh, we um, work with the social sciences um, and also with the natural sciences. For example, I work a lot with people in climate science and particle physics and other of our colleagues work with, for example, bioinformatics colleagues. Okay, yeah, again, to just kind of show a couple of faces here. In statistics, we have Babak Shababa and Hal Stern um, that we closely interact with. We have uh, colleagues similarly in mathematics and physics, cognitive science, and um, particular sociology and social sciences. Okay. So in UC Irvine, we have a lot of um, sort of centers that are, um, you know, speci specifically funded entities that, that deal primarily with data science and machine learning. Um, and there are many of those. For example, there's the Institute of Genomics and Bioinformatics. Um, there's the UCI Data Science Initiative. And, and most recently, we have a, a new collaboration with the Hasso Plattner Institute in Germany who are uh, funding some of our students through fellowships as well. And we have a rapid exchange or a vivid exchange also with that German partnering organization. 
We're also pretty active in terms of reaching out and collaborating with the neighboring universities. So you can say that you know um, Southern California is certainly a kind of a hub for machine learning research because we have also many strong neighboring universities, as you all know, like you know the um, uh, UC San Diego, for example, which is only an hour away, or in the north we have UCLA and Caltech and uh, uh, USC. And among those universities, we're very actively um, organizing uh, annual symposia, symposia and also um, uh, yeah, workshops, both in NLP in particular and in, in machine learning. So for example, the last time UC Irvine was hosting the um, such a symposium was in 2018. And, and this year, we are kind of jointly with UC San Diego, we are organizing a remote machine learning and NLP symposium, for example, right? And so this gives you kind of a great opportunity to also meet other people in the, the region. So let me spend a few minutes on talking on some research highlights specifically in, in my group. And this is kind of largely only focusing on one aspect, which is that of data compression using machine learning models. So as some of you might know, uh, the common paradigm of, of data compression is, or like if there was a motto of that, it would probably be uh, don't transmit what you can already predict, right? So the better you can predict something, the less you have to memorize it and the more compactly you can compress something, right? And this naturally links uh, data compression to probabilistic machine learning where you uh, essentially reason about probability distributions in data space that, that you're trying to efficiently estimate, for example, using neural networks. So what I wanna talk about also is about another paradigm that we came up with here, which uh, corresponds to another motto, namely, uh, don't transmit that you're not sure about, right? So for example, uh, if there's a lot of uncertainty uh, about a number, you would probably not care about specifying every single decimal place, but you would kind of more intuitively round that number to say like, for example, what's the population of Rome in the year 500? You would probably say 100,000 as opposed to, you know, giving a very detailed answer because there's a lot of uncertainty about it. So how can we teach machine learning models to exploit such posterior uncertainties uh, in the language of Bayesian statistics for better data compression. Yeah, uh, so the first paradigm of kind of don't transmit what you can already predict is of course very established in, in, uh, in, in data compression and particular video compression. And I just wanna quickly highlight here that we've been very active on that um, in terms of both, uh, you know, coming up with one of the first neural video codecs in 2019 and nowadays uh, having kind of the best performance, the best performing neural video codecs that we just published at iClear. Uh, so the general idea is that you have a previous video frame and then you, you know, use a neural network to essentially make a prediction for the next frame. Uh, you can see here, if you look closely into that region of the dog's fur, there's kind of shaking itself and there are tiny droplets. So the network is very uncertain about it at, at this point, it predicts sort of a blurry prediction. Um, and so, um, you know, and, and then the network is also making a, a prediction about its own confidence. And it says, well, I'm very uncertain about how the, the middle part here of the video will evolve. And, and, um, and so what we do then is we kind of memorize explicitly all the tiny details and compress it as a separate image. But it's a very sparse image and therefore it can be efficiently compressed. And then finally, when you reconstruct the video, you're kind of doing a weighted average between these three things and you reconstruct the next frame, right? So this is kind of, if you will, the old paradigm of don't transmit what you can already predict. But you can also use posterior uncertainties for compression. Uh, and this actually leads to this VBQ algorithm that I cannot really tell you much about because it's a little too technical, but what you see here essentially is a posterior distribution with only with a mean and, an, and a variance. And that Bayesian posterior tells you something about the uncertainty about a data point. And our algorithm exploits this uncertainty, sorry about that, to come up with better data compression, right? What you see here is essentially, um, uh, result on compressing a neural network model or in more detailed, um, it's actually a neural word embedding model. As you go down to smaller rates, uh, the accuracy of the model suffers, but essentially what we care about is about maintaining a lot of the accuracy at low bit rates. And you see that um, compared to various baselines, we are sort of doing much better here by exploiting the corresponding posterior uncertainty. So Reverend Bayes would have certainly liked it because it relates to um, you know, Bayesian statistics. Okay. We can also look at qualitative results uh, when this is the original image. Uh, typically JPEG would have these kind of uh, box-like artifacts. And if you use neural codecs, uh, you'll actually typically see nicer and smoother reconstructions and also higher quality reconstructions. Okay. 
so that's kind of my final slide uh, to conclude. UC Irvine is a great place to study machine learning. Uh, we have many outstanding faculty and students. Um, our interests are pretty broad. Today you learned only about a tiny part of it. Uh, you know, we, we uh, do work on algorithms and theory, probability and statistics, computer vision, NLP, computational biology, and many other um, domains. And yeah, with, life, with that, I'd like to uh, close. Hopefully you all have the chance to uh, meet some of us in person because we're hosting um, like a gather town meeting at 2 p.m. where you're all invited and there will be a, a poster session. So thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Stefan. And uh, I think we had uh, a couple of questions that uh, we got here in the chat box. The first one is uh, a question about where to get information about the upcoming uh, ML symposium that you mentioned. I see that someone responded with a website. So <laughs> if I, uh, Yeah, I exactly. There, there's a website and the symposium will take place, um, I believe, in, in roughly uh, 10 days or something. Uh, I think it's a Monday and Tuesday. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. And uh, the other question is, it's more of a general question, but maybe you can give your personal perspective on, on what you've seen. Uh, the question is whether it's possible to find co-advisors during the PhD if the research interest of the students overlaps uh, uh, in two areas. Um, oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, we actually do a lot of co-advising. So, for example, I personally, um, you know, co-advise with Paul Rick Smith um, and, uh, you know, with many such arrangements that there's sort of one PhD student advised by two, uh, by two advisors. So that's perfectly common. Um, yeah. So in general, I would say we have a very open uh, collaborative culture and, uh, you know, uh, we, we, we kind of we all know each other pretty well and uh, and and work together on various projects. Yeah. Great, wonderful. Thank you so much, Stefan. And um, I think, uh, of course, if anyone has any more questions, feel free to write them in the chat box. And I think now we're ready for the next uh, introductory talk uh, by Michael. Okay, hi everyone. So I'm Michael Franz, and um, I'm actually going to be talking about security. So, okay. And security is not is, is slightly different at UCI from the other things we've heard about today, um, because it's not really a, a single group doing things. So security is what the National Science Foundation, for example, calls like a cross-cutting concern. So there's lots of people doing things that are related to computer security in very different areas. So, so I've tried to group it uh, mostly, but there's people doing system security and most of these uh, consider themselves systems researchers. So even though I wasn't mentioned on Sanjita's slide, I actually cons consider myself a systems researcher uh, front and foremost. And so Adelan, Anton, Alfred, Brian, and I are, are really doing systems, but with a security theme. Then there are people doing applied cryptography, uh, which are things like protocols, uh, and they use crypto as a black box, as a tool to achieve something uh, with uh, security in mind. And then there's people who are doing the actual cryptographic algorithms. And not surprisingly, we actually even have people in the math department uh, that are working on that who are not really computer scientists, um, but they're building the building blocks for cryptography. And then there is a, a lot of people in the informatics department that are looking at the usability and privacy aspects uh, of the security problem, like how do you make sure that someone doesn't, uh, you know, succumb to a phishing attack or something like that. So just to give you an idea, so so why is this important? Well, so I'm now again speaking from the systems perspective, right? Uh, in system security, we really deal with um, vulnerabilities that are possibly being uh, exploited, and if you just open the news, you may have notice that right now we have this huge problem going on, which is just this week's problem in computer security, where there is actually a remote code execution vulnerability in Microsoft Exchange server. And there is literally tens of thousands of businesses uh, that are having all their corporate confidential emails uh, siphoned off by some uh, hackers uh, somewhere in the world. And um, just today, or yesterday, Microsoft actually uh, re revealed that there's yet another remote code execution vulnerability. So these keep on coming. And so the problem is there are 
critical bugs and critical is like a code word that Microsoft uses for things that are really, really bad. It essentially means someone uh, can take over your computer completely. And the question is, you know, are there people who know about these bugs who can actually uh, exploit them? And so one would think this is old stuff, right? Why do we still have this? And so the problem is sometimes you have really long lived vulnerabilities. So for example, this is the longest vulnerability that I'm aware of. There was a bug that um, uh, was only fixed in 2009, but that had been in the Linux kernel since 2001. And that means like eight years, the Linux kernel had a complete takeover uh, vulnerability that anyone who knew about the bug could have just taken over the, the machine. And that of course means also the whole Android operating system. So for eight years, anyone who would have known this would have been able to completely take over your machine uh, for Linux, right? So that's pretty bad. Um, to give you another example, um, there was a bug uh, called Stage Fright that was discovered in Android uh, in 2010, that if you sent a specially formed uh, uh, a multimedia message to the device, you can take over the device. So at the time this was discovered, there were 1 billion devices that were affected. So the problem with Android, of course, is that there are actually no longer any updates after a very short time. Like after two years, you no longer get Android updates. So um, it is actually, uh, you know, assume that even today, there's still hundreds of millions of devices that run an old version of Android. Many of these are embedded devices uh, in, in you know, hardware that is supposed to do other things. And all of these are susceptible. And because these devices are no longer being updated and because you can't, you know, most users uh, cannot get an update to this device, uh, in most Western countries, the government is actually forcing the network providers to filter out these messages because the devices themselves cannot be protected in any other way. Um, so your network provider is looking actively for these um, exploit MMSs and is trying to remove them before they reach the device because there's no other way to, to fix this old, this old bug. Um, so what some of you may know, so it used to be that hacking was this gentlemanly thing that, that kids uh, did and, you know, everyone was nice to each other and, and, and it was more sports. And now, unfortunately, hacking seems to be a big business. And you may have heard about this. If you haven't, you should probably Google for it. Um, there are companies that are called vulnerability brokers and they basically buy knowledge about such uh, hackable places in software and they resell it to the highest bidder. Um, so right now, this is the, the Zerodium is one of the bigger ones. They have a price list that you can look at on your, on the webpage. You get a million dollars if you find, uh, you know, a, one of the vulnerabilities in the top right corner, no question asked. And in the, in the mobile space, the prices are even higher you get two and a half million dollars, no question asked, if you are able to sell a vulnerability to Zerodium, um, you know, zero click Android uh, uh, exploit. So, so it's big business. There's lots of companies in this space, small companies where people actually find bugs for a living and then don't tell the manufacturer, but actually just sell it to governments or I don't really wanna know. Um, and of course, you know, the companies uh, that make the hardware are also in on the, on, the, on the game, right? So Apple will actually buy uh, a vulnerability for a million dollars. Um, you know, at the Reed Zerodium, you can get two and a half million dollars. If you sell it to Apple, you can sleep better at night because you know Apple's going to fix it and, and it's not going to do nefarious things with it. But, but uh, it's a big business. So um, this quick question, is open source any better? And no, open source is probably not better because um, it just enables highly resourced adversaries to analyze the code. So there's all these automated bug finding tools and we ourselves have been working on some of these. Um, 
And the problem with the automatic bug finding tools is they're quite labor intensive usually because they generate lots of false positives and someone has to go and look at all these bug reports. Now, if you're doing this on a military budget um, because you're a government, um, you might actually be able to find more bugs than the good guys in the open source community who are developing the, source, the software in the first place. So you get an asymmetric uh, situation where the attacker knows more about your your bugs than, than the person who originally wrote the software. Not a good situation. So um, in many ways, at least in the systems uh, uh, security, we have this interesting cat and mouse spy versus spy situation where um, you know, attackers find vulnerabilities, defenders def invent a mechanism uh, to fix the vulnerability, and it goes on and on and on because they're very smart people in, in, this, in this space and um, there's lots of money in this space and hence uh, lots of energy goes into, you know, as soon as a, a, a vulnerability is fixed, attackers attempt to find a way around it. So give you just an example of some of the research that, that we've been doing in my group. So we've been working on essentially three different areas, automated bug finding, um, and we developed new ways of finding bugs. And we actually found real bugs in flagship uh, phones. So in Samsung Galaxy devices and in Google Pixel devices, right, you know, devices that were current at the time we found these bugs. Um, we also found some bugs in Intel's processors um, for which the students actually got a very substantial monetary reward. I as the professor didn't take any of that. Um, but, uh, uh, and um, so we've been presenting our work, not just in academic venues, but also at uh, by invitation only events. So we've presented at Black Hat USA several times and we've in, uh, in, uh, presented at Qualcomm's uh, closed door security summit uh, for the device vendors that, that actually manufacture these phones. Um, and as far as I know, we're the only academic research group in the world that is actually part of Apple's uh, hardware security device program where they give you a hackable iPhone and ask you if you find any bugs, please tell us. Um, the other two projects are multivariate execution environments. I'm going to talk about that very quickly. And we've talked also been working on binary lifting, which means we take an existing binary, we try to basically lift it to a compiler uh, intermediate representation, then we apply security, and then we generate binary code again that's better than the binary code that we started with. So quickly um, to show you what, what, for example, bugs look like. So everyone knows that you have an operating system, a system called boundary, and that's very well protected, right? We have user mode, kernel mode, and, and that is typically where it's very difficult to, to um, attack the, the processor uh, with. And then unfortunately we have a second boundary, which is this hardware OS boundary. And that is not as well protected as you would want it to be. So um, you have lots of different chips that come from different vendors and each vendor, vendor provides their own device driver. And these are sometimes very sloppily written um, because you know, not many people look at this, at this stuff. And so uh, for example, um, the threat model, right? So you have a, for example, a Wi-Fi chip. And the Wi-Fi chip um, actually uses uh, an IOMMU to write uh, to a certain part of the memory. Uh, and the problem is that device driver, is it, sorry, that chip can write to that memory at any time. So um, for example, I have a device driver and the device driver actually has a check to see if whatever's written by the device uh, you know, has certain properties. And after the check, the hardware device just changes the bits there. And if the device driver isn't written properly, um, you might then actually be able to, uh, you know, the second time it looks, the data has changed. The device driver wasn't written to actually cache the, the, the thing that was read and use the cached value. And so the attacker could actually attack. So this is an actual attack that happened uh, in a, uh, um, the Samsung Galaxy devices where you could actually take over the phone simply by getting within Wi-Fi range 
and and sending a certain uh, sequence to the um, chip on the device that was the Wi-Fi driver. Um, and so what we what we do in the security research thing is we typically use responsible disclosure, which means we tell the manufacturer, hey, you have a major vulnerability to give the manufacturer time to fix the vulnerability before you publish the, the paper. Because the minute you publish it, um, that means that the attackers actually get to work and, and, and try to actually use that vulnerability uh, to, to take over devices. Uh, typically, just to give you another idea of the kind of the, the research that we do. Um, so we have all these buffer overflow vulnerabilities and even today they're still relevant, unfortunately. Um, so so um, how do you fix this? Well, one of the ways you can fix it by actually using redundancy. Um, and so uh, give you an idea, um, if I have a multi-core processor, I could actually uh, run the same program in parallel in two different versions that are automatically generated by a compiler. And in one, I grow the stack in one direction, in the other, I grow it in the other direction. So if I have, and, and there's a vulnerability somewhere in the program, but I don't know where it is. Right? There's no, you know, there may be multiple vulnerabilities, but now I have a vulnerability that an attacker knows about. And for example, the, the vulnerability means there is a, a buffer that is not checked, a, a, you know, a missing range check. And so what happens is that the missing range check has the same effect on both of these versions, but on one of the versions, it overflows the return address as the attacker is trying to do. But on the other one, the return address is stored somewhere else. And so the same action has a different result. And the cool thing about this is if I use this kind of, of, of end version programming, I can actually uh, detect the attack in real time. And at that moment, uh, when I get to the return, I can realize, oh, there's something really bad happening here because these two versions that are executing in parallel should be doing the exact same thing at all times. And, and so this is something that we actually did here and I actually got a patent on this. Uh, so it's a, uh, it's, a, it's a patent that you can see is, is actually assigned to uh, the university, but it was, invented, it was invented here. And so the idea here would be that you generate many different versions automatically, um, you ship the versions to the user and then you pick a random set of these and execute them in parallel. And by that, you are not, you know, you're never fully protected, but you are raising the bar to an attacker uh, by a lot because the attacker now actually has to find vulnerabilities in three different versions. Uh, and, um, and you want an odd number because then you can use majority voting uh, to basically uh, find out what should be going on here and what is most likely going to be an attack. Um, and, and an even bolder approach would be, um, you know, you could actually create a unique version of every program for every person in the universe um, uh, using compiler technology. So that's something that we've also been working on. Um, and, and the idea here was, you know, you could actually make the app store on your device generate, you know, as many versions as you want. Nobody buys software in boxes anymore. And the main problem at the moment for using this kind of approach is actually the distribution. Because when you're downloading Firefox from Mozilla, you're not actually downloading it from Mozilla, you're downloading it from Akamai or one of these, these, these uh, network edge caches. And the whole distribution system um, is sort of relying on the fact that lots of people are downloading the same binary. Um, and in our approach here, lots of people would have to download different binaries um, so you may actually have to offload the generation of the versions to a different place in the overall distribution system. Um, so if this interests you, um, you know, just some places to, to look. Someone asked for conferences earlier. So these are the, the top four are the main uh, conferences in uh, computer security. They're extremely competitive. This is a very ex uh, competitive area to be in. So some of these, most of all of these conferences have several hundred submissions. There is one conference, the USENIX Security Symposium, that has over a thousand submissions. And they all have uh, acceptance rates under 17%, where some of them are now under 12%. 
So, so lots and lots and lots of, you know, pretty much, uh, you know, everyone is trying to be in these top four conferences and um, an acceptance rate of 12% is, is pretty tough. Uh, so you'll see lots of rejection uh, and as a grad student, you'll have to live with, with that. Uh, but if you do make it, then you are like the king. And, and at the bottom, I have uh, Black Hat and DEF CON, which are not academic conferences, but uh, security is one of those areas where the, the academics and the uh, industry people are actually fairly close together. Um, and um, so you can actually take academic papers and present them at industrial conferences and people will listen if you are doing things that is relevant to them. And with that, I'm saying thanks. And I'm actually thanking all the people who've been, been funding us uh, in, you know, across uh, all the different security projects. Thank you very much. Great, thank you so much. Uh, uh, yeah, thank you so much, Michael, this, this was a great, and uh, thank you to all the, uh, the speakers in this session. Uh, so this was concluding the session uh, for the introductory talks. And we're going to start shortly with the uh, uh, grad student panel. Of course, if you have any more questions for the speakers in the first session, feel free to uh, write them in Slack and we'll be sure to forward it to them. Uh, maybe let's take a few minutes break before we start with the next session. So let's take around the five minutes break and then we come to the second session in the morning that is a, for the Q&A session for graduate student panel. See you in about five minutes. <laughs>